Welcome to this special edition of Dan Factoids. As you might imagine, Dan has received a number of inquiries regarding the current COVID-19 pandemic. We have also issued travel advisories and for South Africans there are restrictions on travel issued by our President as part of the 21-day lockdown. Other countries both in and outside our Dan Southern Africa region have issued similar restrictions and these should be heeded. There is unfortunately also a lot of fake news floating around, so we encourage you to verify the facts and consult reputable sources for information. The formal COVID-19 websites are the National Institute for Communicable Diseases which contains up-to-date information and we will post verified information that are relevant to divers as these become available. So with that preamble I want to start by saying that we will not be addressing the typical COVID-19 issues in this factoid issue but rather selected responses to questions posed by DAN members including those who may still be in remote areas and may be wondering how to manage their limited resources optimally. There is of course something relevant in this for everybody so please keep watching. Here are four questions we received that offer a backdrop for the answers we would like to provide. Firstly, could you help me to get a plan on how to assist somebody with breathing problems due to COVID-19 with the oxygen we keep at our dive center? A second example, as we are without medical assistance in remote areas and would like to have a simple protocol to follow and the oxygen use we uh, can provide for diving emergencies and apply it to this situation, how much oxygen should we give, by what method and for how long? Please advise. Thirdly, I'm a DAN provider and instructor and have the following question for you. I have a DAN oxygen rescue pack with two 6 litre cylinders. Would a flow rate of 15 litres be of any use? to a person with respiratory symptoms due to COVID-19 and if not, what do you suggest? And lastly, could hyperbaric oxygen, in other words recompression, help people suffering from COVID-19? These are all very relevant questions and for the first three I would like to refer you back to the downloadable DAN guidebook sent out under the email heading prepare don't panic which is on the Dan Southern Africa blog. I do want to speak to the issue of oxygen utilization moving symptomatic individuals and hyperbaric oxygen however. Limited supplies of oxygen and difficulties in gaining access to specialized medical assistance are definitely some of the most pressing challenges. But before addressing these, let us not forget the primary advice on social distancing, self-quarantining and self-isolation. Self-quarantining means staying in the same building with other potentially exposed but asymptomatic individuals. Self-isolation means isolating symptomatic individuals where there is a high suspicion that their symptoms are due to COVID-19 due to contact with other COVID-19 positive individuals or travel from high risk areas. These individuals should keep themselves in a separate room and use only their own linen and cutlery. The main concern for individuals in self-isolation is when one should move them to further medical care and if the decision is to be made to do so, how to optimize the use of any available oxygen. To keep things simple, 
I'd like to offer four key considerations which may be relevant depending on the specific situation. Firstly, as for all our DAN first aid courses, provider safety is vital. So wear gloves and use or improvise masks and eye protection if you do not have professional masks and splash guards as necessary. But either way, try to shield your own mouth, nose and eyes while assisting a symptomatic individual. Secondly, remember that there may be other diseases like influenza, tick bite fever, malaria, traveler's diarrhea or dysentery that may mimic COVID-19 infections and for which isolation may lead to a disastrous outcome completely unrelated to COVID-19, particularly malaria. So if you are in a malaria area and the individual started developing symptoms after being in an area with infected mosquito exposure for at least seven days, especially if there are no or only incidental respiratory symptoms, please assume a high probability of malaria and treat them for it if fever and flu-like symptoms develop, while of course keeping the person isolated from asymptomatic individuals. Refer to our material on malaria for this purpose. Also advise individuals who are still at risk of contracting malaria to implement the prescribed anti-malaria precautions, especially during the 21 day of the lockdown, including taking doxycycline or malarone, malonil, depending on where it comes from, and even mefloquine or larium, as they are not going to be diving for a while and the risk of malaria becomes greater than the risk of adverse medication reactions after 14 days. Thirdly, encourage honesty so that people admit symptoms earlier. If respiratory symptoms and breathlessness reach the point where the individual is showing obvious signs of escalating respiratory distress, and especially if there is relentless coughing and breathing rates in excess of 25 to 30 per minute or cyanosis which is where the lips and skin takes on a bluish color this is a definite turning point in moving the individual if there is a reasonable chance of getting them to a higher level of medical care and respiratory support. Lastly the issue of oxygen. Breathing oxygen via a demand valve remains the least wasteful way of providing oxygen. If the person has the strength to breathe through an O2 demand valve, they should do this at a frequency that is just sufficient to offer relief of critical symptoms. Pulses or bouts of oxygen will also allow supplies to last longer. If there is no oxygen demand valve, connect the oxygen supply to a pocket mask and set the flow rate on half to one liter per minute oxygen and have the person breathe through the filter fitted to the pocket mask. By using the pocket mask, you will be protecting those caring for the individual to some extent. Try to stretch your supplies as best you can, considering the distance and time getting to medical care. Also, the longer the distance, the earlier you may want to consider moving the individual. Note that nasal prongs may aerosolize viruses and non-rebreather masks require flow rates that are too high and therefore wasteful. So both these are impractical with limited supplies of oxygen. Also realize that some cases deteriorate rapidly 
within two to three hours. So don't delay cases where the suspicion of COVID-19 is high. Be aware of the potential fire risk when using oxygen in enclosed spaces. And as said before, rather give bouts of oxygen as required to ease symptoms as you make your way to a medical facility. Importantly, we would advise you as far as possible not to attempt to treat a person getting ill with potential COVID-19. As we said, some individuals have deteriorated quite fast and it's therefore important to have medical care available if this is possible, rather than thinking that oxygen alone would cure the disease. In closing, just a brief comment on hyperbaric oxygen or recompression. It is not readily available and it requires highly trained critical care staff who are familiar with the complications of using hyperbaric oxygen, especially if its use is to be considered in COVID-19 patients. It is most certainly not considered a standard of care at this stage. For those interested, a reference is provided on a series of cases treated with hyperbaric oxygen. However, this is a relatively low level of evidence and should not delay getting persons to conventional intensive medical care. Thank you for watching this Dan Factoid on COVID-19 and please remember to refer to the guidebook on Prepare, Don't Panic by Dan Southern Africa.